Well, it's wonderful to see everyone here tonight on such a cold, uh, cold night, so thank you. I'd like to especially thank all students who are here joining us. Um, we're here to, uh, we're honored to present the photography of Michael Nye and his multimedia exhibition, The Fine Line, Mental Health, Mental Illness, and to be able to participate in the dialogue of this year's common experience theme, Minds Matter, Exploring Mental Health and Illness. This traveling exhibition provided the first opportunity for the Whitliff's Photography Collection to participate with the common experience. Michael Nye's exhibition is a powerful documentary that combines voices, stories, and portraits that confront stereotypes and reveal the courage and fragility of those living with mental illness. The Fine Line exhibition is sponsored by the Whitliff Collections, The Common Experience, and CFAN Company. Please help me recognize and thank um, our, our corporate sponsor, CFAN Company, who is represented tonight by Laura Lucas and Melba Cantu. We are also honored to have our founding donors with us, Bill and Sally Whitliff. <laughs> and the president of Texas State University, Dr. Denise Trouth. The vice president of information technology, Dr. Van Wyatt. Our associate Vice President and University Librarian, Joan Heath. And our Director of the Whitliff Collections, Dr. David Coleman. <laughs> also joining us are Texas State's Common Experience Co-Chairs, um, Diane McCabe and Joe Meyer. And um, with every exhibition we have, uh, there are unique um, situations. And with Michael's, Michael Nye's exhibition, we had a, this is the first time we've been um, kind of combined audio with the visual. And so I'd like to thank Doug Mortensen for his great installation. Um, thank you, Doug. Um, Joe Meyer, co-chair of the Common Experience and director of institutional research will be introducing Michael Nye. And I just briefly want to mention that after Michael's presentation, you'll have a, an opportunity to ask questions. Um, mm -hmm. Please help me welcome Joe Meyer. Wow, it's so good to see so many people here tonight. Um, it's really, really wonderful. Um, the Common Experience is a year-long initiative at Texas State that's designed to cultivate an intellectual conversation and enhance student engagement in the academic arena uh, and foster a sense of community across the entire campus and beyond. Um, this year's theme, Minds Matter, Exploring Mental Health and Illness is relevant due to its prominence in the national news. And it's important to college uh, students. Um, college uh, age is an age when many people first begin to experience the symptoms of mental health issues. Um, and, it, and finally, it's a topic that's uh, very personally important to me because I have depression and I'm the father of a child that has bipolar disorder. And uh, in fact, um, it was about eight years ago when I stumbled across uh, Michael Nye's exhibit at the Witte Museum in San Antonio where it opened. And it was just a couple of months after my son was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and I was feeling very alone and isolated at the time. And uh, his exhibit gave me a lot of hope. And so uh, once uh, I started working with faculty and students here on campus, uh, on the Common Experience program, I knew that, that I really wanted to uh, have Michael's exhibit uh, shown here on campus. Okay, so our guest speaker tonight, Michael Nye, lives in downtown San Antonio. He practiced law for 10 years before pursuing photography full time. He's the recipient of a Mid-America National Endowment for the Arts grant in photography and a Kronkowski Foundation grant. 
He participated in two Arts America tours in the Middle East and Asia, and has exhibited and lectured widely in museums and universities in Morocco, India, and Mexico. Nye's photography projects have taken him around the world, including to Russian Siberia, Iraq after the Gulf, first Gulf War, Palestine, China, and Labrador. His exhibitions of audio accompanied photographs, uh, children of children, stories of teenage pregnancy, and the one here, fine line mental health, mental illness, have traveled to over 120 cities in the United States and continue to go on tour. Um, he is married to writer Naomi Shihab Nye, and they have one son, Madison, uh, who I believe is here with us tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming Michael Nye. I need to bring the microphone a little bit lower. Um, every story has a point of view. And I think once we recognize and aware of a point of view, it becomes precious and valuable and important. Thank you all for really coming tonight in this cold and wet evening. Uh, just over a year ago, we lost a really important intellectual, Jacques Barzin. I don't know if some of you had met him, but he died at 104 years old. And one night we were having dinner with Jacques and Marguerite. He was a philosopher, historian, storyteller, teacher. And he told this remarkable story about growing up in Paris. And every day as a young boy, he'd walk home and stop by and visit his great grandmother who was born in 1840. Yes, he was a bridge between centuries. To put that in perspective, Abraham Lincoln, when she was born, was 31 years old. And he took an interest in Jacques, and he said she liked to reminisce and told stories of her childhood events, crises, tragedies. And he said that was the moment when history became alive to me. What a beautiful thing to say. Stories are the threads that bind us together. I do want to thank uh, Bill and Sally Whitliff for having this incredible collection, for being curious, and for really caring about words and images. Everyone that speaks to them talks with great enthusiasm and care. Thank you all for inviting me here. Thank you, David. Thank you, Carla and Michelle. Thank you, Doug, for installing it. And Carla is an incredible organization whiz. I wish I had some of her skills. Thank you also, Joe, for connecting this exhibit with the Whitliff uh, Galleries. Um, I remember, it seems like everyone is talking about breaking news these days. Everywhere you go, and I think anyone that just focuses on breaking news or headline news misses almost everything. They miss the way a story feels from the inside. They miss the way a voice rises and falls. They miss the silence between words, what's not said. And I think we all recognize how important it is to travel off of the highway as much as we can and to swerve, not swerve away from things, but into into risky things and positive things and into all the possibilities of our days. I found a poem that I'd like to read by a Czechoslovakian poet, Mirzalov Polub, Napoleon. Children, when was Napoleon Bonaparte born? Asked the teacher. A thousand years ago, said the children. A hundred years ago, said the children. Yesterday, said the children. Nobody knows. Children, when did Napoleon, what did Napoleon do, asked the teacher. He won a war, said the children. He lost a war, said the children. No one knows. Our butcher used to have a dog, said Frankie. And his name was Napoleon. And the butcher used to beat him and the dog died of hunger one year ago, and now all the children feel sorry for Napoleon. 
I can't think of Napoleon today without thinking of that dog that was mistreated. Stories do rest on edges of surprise and revelation. My own ramblings began in Newton, Kansas. It's a small town outside Wichita. And it's really famous for trains passing through. You would see the Missouri Pacific and the Reading Railroad heading out to the high, flat prairies and the wheat fields and the mountains beyond that. The first time I got into any really serious trouble was in the second grade. My teacher said I was daydreaming, and she took me by my hand to the principal's office. And so she went to find the principal. I was there alone. I remember a crucifixion on the wall. It seemed large with nails and blood and thorns. And in front of me was a red button that said push, and I was just learning to read. So I got my finger and pointed it toward this button and pushed it, and of course, the fire drill went off. <laughs> and all the grades, one through eight, went pouring outside, looking to the sky for smoke. Within seconds, four nuns, and if my memory is correct, they were over six foot six each, I'm sure. <laughs> they were huge. And the main nun had a vein right in the middle of her forehead that was pulsating. And she said, Mikey, did you press that button? And I said, no, I did not. <laughs> and so, so my life went on from there. A few years ago, I read this story that I really liked. It's a story of a man that was a newspaper reporter in Phoenix, Arizona, and all he did was call people up on the phone and interview them. He never left his office. And then he wrote up the story and gave it to the publisher, and they published it. And so one day, his parents called, and they talked about just regular life, mowing the lawn, mashed potatoes, corn on the cob, fighting with a neighbor, a storm approaching. And when they were hanging up, the parents said to their son, the reporter, we love you. Take care of yourself. Come visit soon. And when he hung up, he realized he had been recording this conversation, didn't think much of it, tucked it in the back of the drawer. And many years later, after his parents had died, he found that tape and listened to it. And he said, of all the things I own, that's the most important. Why? Because it was real. It felt real. And that's what I hope to do with this exhibit was to do something that not only felt real, but was real, not try to persuade or convince anyone of any point of view, but only to have a fidelity to each person's experience, to tell the truth. In my statement, I write, I don't know where mental health ends and mental illness begins but this exhibits about the fine line that weaves through our lives and at times we hold on for balance. I also mention that this exhibit is about the mysterious genes that we each inherit and carry as gifts or burdens and pass on to the next generation. We are the vessels in this intricate network of conveyances I spent four years, I was such a privilege to travel around this country, mostly in Texas, San Antonio, and to listen to hundreds of stories. And over the 18, last 18 years, I've been doing photographic stories. And there's one thing I know for certain, is that no one knows the life of another. No one does. Mental illness is about thinking and mood and behavior. It's cognitive, it's emotional. Sometimes there's loneliness, other times there's a longing to feel better. Sometimes it's about finding things, other times about losing, about recovery, about so many, so many things. It's complicated. I spent two to four days with each person, and I can't tell you all the things I learned. And one of the premises behind this exhibit and my other ones is a belief that everyone has a wisdom about their own life. 
Everyone knows something that no one else knows. There's something there valuable in every one of these stories in the next rooms, if you'll listen. And so the way I see this exhibit is that everyone there is a teacher, and we are students putting on headphones and listening to them. Mental illness is not caused by a weakness of character, and mental illness is treatable. That's my anthem. In this exhibit, there's a man by the name of Vinny, and he loves Italian food, and he liked baseball. And as a teenager, he decided to quit speaking, and he didn't speak again for over, I don't know, something like 15 years he didn't speak. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And one day in a mental health clinic, someone next to him, just this anonymous person that he didn't know, said, Vinny, tell me about your life. And Vinny said, I, I just started talking, and I couldn't stop. And it opened up a gate, and I'm talking everywhere I go now. In this exhibit, there's a woman by the name of Beth, and she was the most talented student in her high school. She wrote poems and performed her songs on stage. But at home, her parents were horribly abusive. They locked her in closets, deprived her of food, her father sexually abused her. She said her mother was the worst. And in her narrative, she's the one standing in a garden. In her narrative, she talks about kindness, and about children, and about libraries, and about things that we all care about. She suffers from agoraphobia and stayed in her ch kitchen chair for years and did not leave. In this exhibit, too, there is a man by the name of Michael. And he was part owner of an alternative newspaper. And in high school, he was his vice president. And he said he had a gift for making people laugh. And one day at the computer screen, he said he started crying for no reason and cried for seven days and could not stop. He was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, a very brave, incredible human being. Also in this exhibit, there is, in fact, not in this exhibit, in my hunger exhibit, there's a young woman by the name of Tiffany. I should have put her in this exhibit. And she learned Japanese as a little girl. And she told me, my stomach hurts in Japanese. And uh, she said that she has bipolar disorder. And she said, sometimes I look in the mirror and I don't even know who I am. And that's what I'm trying to find out. It was January, kind of like tonight. It was in the low 30s. It was drizzling. She was sleeping next to a convenience store and trying to go to sleep. But she was just miserable, she said. And this car drove up. And this man got out and gave her $5 and then drove away. And about 45 minutes later, he came back with a bag of groceries. And then he did a remarkable thing. He took off all of his clothes, took off his jacket, his undershirt, his pants, his shoes, his socks. Tiffany said, we didn't exchange a word. We just looked at each other eye to eye. And he got back in the car in his underwear and drove off. I hope he wasn't pulled over for <laughs> running a stop sign or something going home. But Tiffany said, I was shocked and flattered. Wow. I've never heard anyone use the word flattered quite in that way. I started out in my life as a, an attorney, and I had a gradual change to being a photographer. I'll never forget, I was, at, I was in Houston. I saw an exhibition of Paul Strand, Paul Caponegro, and Imogene Cunningham. And it was like a thunderbolt hit me. That night, I couldn't quit thinking, stop thinking about what I saw and what I felt. And so I started studying photography. I'm self-taught, and I use a large 8x10 view camera. It's kind of like the one Matthew Brady used during the Civil War. It's like an accordion. I still use it. I still have a dark room, a wet dark room. And it's a really wonderful instrument. You put plates in the back, and you put a big hood over your head. You put it on a tripod, and you see the image on the ground glass. It's upside down, reversed. But it's really a wonderful way to work. And uh, I think that sometimes in our lives, 
things happen. I started traveling to remote areas, probably not knowing why. I was searching for something. I was really interested in philosophy and interested in Immanuel Kant's four questions. What do you do in your life? What can you know? What does it mean to be human? And what can we expect from the future? And so I did travel alone with my big camera to remote places in the world, Labrador near Greenland. I went to refugee camps in the Middle East. I put my finger on a map in China, right below Tibet near Burma, and went there for a month. I, I, I went to Nome, Alaska in the middle of the winter and took a bush plane that dropped me off in Siberia. And I lived with Chukchi natives and Russian soldiers. I remember one time someone brought this woman upstairs where I was photographing, and they said she was dying. They wanted the last photograph. And I just remember saying, Michael, watch out. You better be careful what you do. And I did go into the Iraq war alone with an 8x10 view camera in a tent through Diyarbakir, Turkey, and to Zaho, Iraq. And I can only remember the silence of the children. That's what stays with me, between the bombing, the silence of the children. It was incredible. One thing happened to me that really changed my life direction. I was in Chiapas, Mexico, and my wife and I were on a uh, residency at Nabalom in, uh, in uh, San Cristobal de las Casas. And so one day I walked up to two Chamula Indians. They were beautiful. And I had my big camera on my back and I said, can I take a, a, fo a photograph of you in, in broken Spanish? And they both turned to me and said no, kind of angrily, which I don't blame them. And one said, if you pay me, you can. And then they went away. I didn't want to work that way. And so that night I went to some bars and started drinking, probably way too many beers. And I came up with this idea that I would be an itinerant photographer, kind of like, just like one you have out in the front room, a, a camera. That's the way they work as an itinerant photographer. And so I made this sign, portraits, 44 cents in the equivalent of Mexican currency. <laughs> and I got a chair in my backdrop, and I set it up in the square. And to my shock, within about 30 minutes, were 40 Indians, Zinnikatans and Chamula Indians lined up, tucking their shirts in, combing their hair. <laughs> getting ready, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was so nervous. I had brought photographic paper and chemistry, so I made contact with a light bulb. And so I took their portraits, and then I developed, processed it, and we decided to meet like in three or four days. And when I met with them, um, I remember they didn't like, most of them didn't like them. They were blurry, or I cut off their legs, so it wasn't in black and white. One guy cut off his head. But he still, want, he still wanted the portrait, but he only paid five cents for it, so that was okay. But I said to myself after that, that, that is the way that I want to work. That is the way I want to work with a reciprocity, with an exchange, with a conversation, where you're giving and taking. That exchange really meant something. And so I think after that, I started really thinking about doing projects with photography and audio. Someone asked me just 15 minutes ago, Michael, what did you learn by working on this project? I learned many things. I'm not a psychiatrist and not a professional, so it was daunting. But I did learn that it takes time to listen, and it takes time to tell a story. It takes time to do those things. I also learned that I also learned that language is so inadequate. Language is so inadequate to describe uh, an experience. And I want to talk more about that in a minute. But I did write some things on photography that I'd like to share too, some thoughts. In portraits, both the photographer and the subject have an idea of what the portrait looks like, but almost always they're surprised. In a portrait, there's always one side that's never seen. Portraits are less than or more than what is seen, often both at the same time. I find a tension in making portraits. It moves and bends. 
Portraits are just a shadow of a person. There's always so much more to know. I hope that in making a portrait, it's the presence, it's the person, it's as, it's as if the person is there in front of you, not the essence, never the essence, but more like a fingerprint. Portraits do evolve. Always one moment that sets off a series of events into something else. Loading negatives in a dark room, I always ask, what light will touch this negative? Black and white photographs are mostly about color. When I look at photographs, I think about what's, out, what's outside the border, what happened next, who spoke first, what was said. As a photographer, I have learned that you can never go back and do it again. It will always be different. You better do it now, and you better do it the best you can. I'm working on a project now on blindness, not about disability, but about attention and phenomenology and perception. And someone was talking about listening is visual. That's true. Listening is another way of seeing. In terms of some things that I've learned also, I've learned that it's really important that anyone with an illness has support, a family member, a stranger, a friend, a, a, a student, someone to help them. Everyone needs someone for help. And I think, too, we can become a part of someone else's story. And this is a terrible example to give, but I'm going to give it anyway. I remember when I was 12 or 13, and my friend Doug and I were playing golf at some golf course. And on a par four, the, the, the second shot was over this big hill, so they couldn't see where the ball landed. And they would hit it up there, and Doug and I would run onto the green and put the ball in the hole and go hide behind a bush. It was very deceptive. <laughs> And when the foursome went up there, they screamed like children, yelling and screaming, <laughs> landing on their stomachs up and down. I've never seen happiness like I saw putting this golf ball in the hole in the green. I know that's a terrible example, but we can become a part of someone else's story by smaller things and larger things. I've also learned words like, and philosophers all say that words are so inadequate to describe experiences, but I did hear words like blinding, unbearable, the uncertainty is worse, worse than you ever imagined, terrifying, afraid, embarrassed. Some people I've heard say, it's like you're not even there, it's nothing, nothing, nothing at all. I've also learned that discrimination and stigma is so damaging and so cruel and painful. Dora says in her narrative, the public looks at us with mental illness like we're not even human. They use terms like lunatic. They talk about you in the third person like you're not even in the room. They think we're all dangerous and they don't even want to be seen in our company. They're afraid to come near us. They think we're contagious. Chelsea, who's blind and with cerebral palsy and lives alone at the age of 24, said to me, prejudice itself is a disability because it takes focus away from everything else. I also learned, I remember once Naomi and I, my wife and I were at a party and I was working on this project. And this woman said, Michael, you're wasting your time. Stories do nothing. Stories won't do anything. Mental illness is far too serious for, study, for, for, for stories. And I said, I think you're wrong. Stories won't heal someone, but what they do is they illuminate. They can shine a light. It's like walking into a dark room and turning on a light before you couldn't see, and now you can. It's like something you already know, but now you know it in a deeper, more thoughtful, more profound way. Stories are important. On a bulletin board, I received thousands of notes from people. 
One wrote, thank you for these stories. I'm so overwhelmed with emotion, I cannot breathe. It's hard to explain how important this has been to me. These stories have given me answers to many questions. I want to play one story, and I'd be, I'd be happy to answer some questions. But I'd like to end with one, one last thought. A few years back, this exhibit opened at the Science Center in Fort Worth, Texas, and the mayor's son had bipolar disorder. And so all, every group in Fort Worth was involved, and they had 900 people at the opening event. And the CEO of a large corporation, multi-billion dollar corporation with tens of thousands of employees, was in the middle of the gallery not listening. And he came up to me and said, Michael, why are you attracted to suffering and misery? It was not a compliment. <laughs> and I think I would say, I said what all of you would say, is I'm not interested in suffering or misery or pain, but I am interested in justice. It's wrong for 60 to 70% of people that are incarcerated or homeless that go with, that have mental illness that are not getting help. It's wrong for poor people or people that can't afford doctors or medication or proper treatment. That's wrong. Justice is the first virtue of a civilized country. Like truth is a virtue of thought. John Rawls writes a lot about justice, books, and he says justice is fairness. It is reciprocity. Justice is doing to others as you want them doing to you. And where you start with justice is by listening. And I want to thank you all for being here and being listeners and going into the next room and listening to some stories. If you don't, I'm going to write your parents <laughs> and tell them that you have been bad and have not been listening to stories. But I would like to end with um, one story. Uh, Susan. It's about, five, it's about five minutes long. My worst fear is uncertainty. You're not certain of, of anything. The constant anxiety, uh, not ever feeling comfortable in your own skin. I have memory seizures. So I have this severe fear that my my brain won't even be able to remember, you know, how to even turn a lock or how to get dressed or, or remember a song even, you know, that I know well. So the, that's fear to me. Fear is not knowing what, 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 what's coming next. The obsessive compulsive behavior and the partial seizures have been around for a long, long time because I had childhood friends tell me of things that I did. I can listen to a one verse for 10 or 15 hours straight over and over and over and over again, a hundred times, you know, or just look at the same picture or a certain movie and a certain frame of the movie that I wanted to see. I, I have no explanation. I just know that to the outside world, you look like a raving psychopath. And I know my neighbors, some of them, must think that when I uh, play my music, I used to be so embarrassed that I would put headphones on and only listen to my music through the headphones so that no one else could hear me be that compulsive. There is no such thing as normal because I don't care what they say or how, how well wrapped they act. Everybody has a mental defect somewhere. Society description of normal is like President Bush. He's classified as a normal person, but if you watch TV that there are drug addicts and alcoholics in his families. So I don't care how well wrapped they act, especially the ones that are sweet and innocent and mention Jesus in every sentence, those are the ones who are really hiding it. <laughs> I check my front door lock about 50, 60 times a day. If you're in my home and you are with me every day, you can pick up my patterns. Uh, I try to hide it. I, I'm compulsive about
keeping things clean, smelling the clean. I have to smell that it's clean. It, it, the smelling it's clean, it's like elevates my mood. Another thing that I'm compulsive about is like if I'm writing you a letter, there can't be any hesitation strokes. If the D doesn't look neat or the A doesn't look neat, I ball it up and throw it in the trash and start over. Believe me, any written work for me is, is, is flawless. It has to be flawless or, or you know, I just can't handle it. It's crazy some of the things that I do, uh, but uh, to me, it's my way of keeping order. The obsessive compulsive behavior, it's like a calling, you know? Like I can be walking and see a, a drop of water on the counter and have to scrub the whole kitchen. It's like a, a tap on your shoulder that you should go do this right now. Summoned is the word because you have to do it right now. Yes. Oh, yes. <coughs> I listen to this song over and over and over and over again as many times as I can. Sometimes 10, 15 hours a day. I, I feel uh, stronger when I hear the music. I feel normal. I'd be happy to answer any questions if. Um... And we ask we ask everyone to go to the microphone, please, to ask your questions so everyone can hear. Thank you. law, my law partner, um, a few years after I left practicing, not because of that, committed, had serious depression and committed suicide. Also, Carrie Crouch, who was the son of Hondo Crouch, uh, people know Hondo, was really the beginning of the exhibit. He had schizophrenia and died. In fact, I entered Shotzi, interviewed Shotzi and the family uh, when I was beginning this. Um, it was daunting at the first. I went to some doctors and they said, no, 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 we, you know, there's confidentiality on it. And I heard about a group of, of, of a group of people that had schizophrenia and I went and spoke to them. And I remember I was just shaking, nervous. And every once said, oh, I'd love to visit with you. And as I started, it was so easy to find people. And I think, I think if someone recognizes that you're serious, it's a serious project, that you're working together, that what they say is important. I spent two to four days with each one, and I told everyone that they had a chance to review the narrative before I used it. And I think that made them feel very comfortable. And no one said no afterwards, because really they felt like they were part of the process. And I did travel around the country, I went to Las Vegas to a clinic and other places. But I had people calling me toward the end, you know, to, to, if I would interview them. Uh, there's some friends in the exhibit that, that have mental health. Uh, Crispin Sartwell, a philosopher, I don't know if y'all listen to his. He has obsessive compulsive disorder, addiction, and other things. 
And so, but I work slowly. I work with one person probably for, you know, three or four weeks. Um, I have four or five hours of interviews, maybe more, and I spend 50 or 60 hours in every five minute piece. And so they're not just casual stories, they're very substantive. I mean, every artist spends a lot of time with what they do. Um, so. Have you encountered a lot of resistance from either venues, galleries, feeling this is inappropriate, or want to tackle this issue? Uh, it seems universally accepted so far from what you've explained. Um, or aside from venues, um, individuals who feel maybe it's, you shouldn't be doing this, that kind of reaction. Have you seen that? Not at all. I mean, it's just been extremely positive. I think part of it is that no one's preaching about, they're not trying to say, this is what mental, this is what you should do, or this is what it is. Everyone's saying, this is my story. This is what happened to me. Um, this is my life. And uh, I think people are you know, very giving. And I think stories, too, get underneath complicated issues where empathy and understanding begin. And I think once you begin listening, you see that it's not trying to do anything. It's not trying to persuade anyone. It's just saying these are some stories of people that are brave enough to talk about their lives. And I really believe in understanding. I really believe in the dialectical process that two people can get together and you can talk and something new can emerge out of that conversation that neither person was aware of. And I heard over and over uh, individuals say that, gosh, I found out something about my life I didn't know just by talking. Or I've never had someone listen that long before. Um, I think one of the common things I heard over and over from so many people is that they wanted to be useful. We all do. We want, we want to be remembered. We want to stand for things. We want to live a life of meaning. And everyone I've met and talked to said that in different ways. You know, there's something really nice about when you're out photographing, just having a set number of negatives, like 10 or five, and that's all you have. And so each picture, you kind of have a different perspective on it. Um, there's a man by the name of Welch Diamond, who I read an article, he was born in 1850 in England. He was a photographer. He studied uh, perception and was a doctor. Uh, I, am, I am going to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> and he said it's really possible to look at someone and not see them at all. That usually uh, discovery, uh, uh, rediscovery comes in change in perspective. I think it's just important to have your camera and film. And it's, there's no, I mean, I'm not sure why I photograph people in certain ways. I know sometimes when I'm interviewing someone, like the girl with the hair over her eye, uh, it was one of the pictures, that's the way she was when I was interviewing her, Josette. It was a story on hunger, she's in the hunger exhibit. Uh, or even the guy with his hand on top of his head. I don't do a lot of directing. Uh, sometimes I do, but generally not too much. I really like the way people stand, the way they hold themselves. I think that some people photograph thinking about the decisive moment. I think about the longer, unwinding moment, the kind of moment that kind of moves more slowly. And it's like when I photograph in Siberia where I had to build little things behind their neck because the exposures were like 30 seconds uh, of the people I met because there was just no light. I mean, I kind of like that where something is building and slower. Each person stood behind, before the camera for a long time. Um, they didn't just stand up there and photograph. And there's something really subtle that moves me about just a person, not just looking at the camera, but looking within themselves, um, looking out, being reflective, like being at a bus stop, kind of waiting to go home, lost in thought. Um, but I don't really plan out 
uh, how the portraits are going to turn out ahead of time. Thank you for that question. How do you make the selection of which one to use? I'm not really sure. I think it's, um, it's I don't know, it's just kind of intuitive. But I'm, you know, I print all my own prints, and it's a real slow process where you print, and then you live with that print, and then you reprint again for size and, and, and contrast. And, and uh, it's, a, it's amazing printing a photograph in a silver dark room. It's, it's real interesting. Hi, I wanted to ask you, um, both of the things that you're doing with, with your project here, the interviewing and then the portrait taking, um, anyone who's tried to do them, it's so difficult in order to develop the rapport with the subjects and to develop that level of trust. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process with the individuals. I know you spent a lot of time with them, but kind of what you did. And then I kind of have a second question too, is that did you ever get a portrait of somebody but didn't really find those? Do you have kind of in your archive, do you have portraits with no stories that attached or vice versa stories, but, but for the purpose of selection, the portraits weren't what you used? Almost everyone that went through the process was in the exhibit. And so if I didn't, it wasn't anything to do with not liking their story, not liking their portrait. If they just went through the process of meeting with me two to four days, sometimes five days, some days six days, you know, it worked out. Um, so there's not any that are just portraits or just stories. Um, I think, always think of stories like winding string around a ball. You just kind of keep rapping and keep talking and keep listening. And again, the process I go through is outlining the whole interview and then kind of memorizing it and then start piecing it together. I've gotten better and better at audio editing. It's a real craft to being able to edit. And like each one of these narratives, there's probably three or four hundred cuts, maybe more in each one of them. Uh, sometimes I'll ask the same question three or four times and commingle them together into one answer, sometimes with their permission. Um, I love a single image with a moving voice. I love that combination. I, I think it's, it, I, I just really, really like it. I think there's so many possibilities with it. Um, but it's just a real slow process of work. really like to hear more about the process that you used to create the recordings. Um, specifically, I'm, I'm really curious about how much of you, you went, went into that creation in terms of like interview questions or, or editing. Um, I, I think that's, a, that's probably a, a really, really good question because as much as I want to say these are trying to have a fidelity to each person's experience, I'm definitely picking and choosing aspects of someone's story that appeals maybe to me or to the story or to the experience. Um, that's very ambiguous. It's, it's hard to explain. Um, I do think in making a story, there's, uh, there's, there's a certain rhythm and tempo. I remember I interviewed a woman that almost everything she said was like the ending of a beautiful short story. I mean, like everything was a poet. And everything she said was just incredible. But the story needed, you know, all the parts of a story to make it work. And I bet I spent 120 hours and I still fell. I could not make a story, even a five minute story out of it. And I had to go back and talk to her again and again to make it work. Um, I know this last woman asked a question about rapport. And I think I really like listening. I really have a curiosity. And I, I hope people feel like that when I'm listening, I really want to learn from them, and I really care about the project and really believe that their story is important. As I said before, the premise is a belief that everyone has a wisdom about their experience. But the process, again, I go through is, is you know, transcribing and then outlining and then trying to piece together, and it just, and then I go into mastering after that, and you have to take out all the things. So it's just a real slow process of going through and making a story. It's really interesting, too, the way a story evolves. 
I really think how tragic it, is, tragic it is that so men, so many men, women, and children live and die, and no one remembers them. Um, I remember in, in, when I was in the Gulf War, someone said, don't forget me. I remember some, um, one of the women here in this exhibit here, she said, I don't think anyone will ever remember me. And here thousands and thousands are hearing her voice and story. Um, thank you for asking that. So thank you all again. Thank you so much. I hope you'll go back in the gallery and listen to one or two more stories. Thank you. I'm honored to be here.